Hello everyone, welcome back to Analog Snippets. If you have ever worked in high voltage circuits, you must have heard of LDMOS. LDMOS is a type of power device. And MOS is simply your familiar MOSFET. And LD stands for literally diffused. Let's now look at these terms into more details. Power devices in general have two defining properties. A low on resistance to reduce the conduction losses and a high blocking voltage. This to sustain high voltages involved in the high power circuits. Low on resistance is achieved by having large device size. We'll have more to say about high blocking voltages in the rest of the video. No need to say that there is a trade-off between the two properties. For a given area of the device, a high blocking voltage means sacrificing some of the R on. High power usually means high voltage and the high current. But in a given device, both high voltages and high currents are not present simultaneously. At least not for the sustained period of time. Let's now look at how high blocking voltages are achieved. A high blocking voltage is sustained across a suitably designed reverse bias PN junction diode. PN junction diodes have bulk regions and space charge region. Bulk regions are simply doped piece of semiconductor. And space charge region is again doped piece of semiconductor but without mobile carriers. During reverse bias condition, only a very small leakage current flows through the circuit. And that means there is no IR drop in the bulk regions. And that means all the voltage drop happens across space charge region. And that is the key point to remember. Another point to remember is that we can't just keep increasing the reverse bias indefinitely. At some point, breakdown happens. Well, breakdown doesn't really happen at a particular voltage. So asking whether a breakdown happens at 10 volts is not really accurate. Because if that 10 volt happens across one nanometer, then sure, yes, breakdown will happen. But if it is across one mile, well, nobody will notice. So the key parameter for breakdown is not voltage, but voltage per length. And in technical jargon, this thing is known as electric field. So breakdown happens when electric field inside this space charge region approaches a critical electric field. In silicon, this value is about 30 volt per micrometer. As you can see, there is a distance involved in this parameter. And that distance is the width of space charge region. So the key to achieving a high blocking voltage is to make the space charge region wider. Under zero bias condition, the width of this space charge region depends on the doping concentration. In this formidable looking equation, Na is acceptor doping concentration and Nd is donor doping concentration. Now let's assume that P side is much heavily doped as compared to the N side. In such scenarios, the numerator is dominated by Na and then it gets cancelled by the denominator Na. So the end result is that if two sides are unequally doped, then width of space charge region is dictated by the lightly doped region. And it is inversely proportional to the square root of doping concentration. The key takeaway is that a diode with high reverse breakdown voltage has a region with very light doping. Okay, now let's decode the letter D. D originally stood for double diffusion. To understand the origin of this term, we need to take a detour to vertical DMOS or simply DMOS. A vertical DMOS starts with an N plus doped silicon. It is highly doped and low resistivity layer. A lightly doped N minus layer is grown over this layer. Then follows the double diffusion. First, a relatively lightly doped P region and then a highly doped N plus region. Now you must be wondering, this looks nothing like MOS. So let's add a gate terminal. Looks better? Maybe not. So let me describe the structure some more. This structure is VD and MOS. So the only P region in this stack has got to be body somehow. The starting N plus is the drain terminal. And the final N plus is the source terminal. 
the region below the gate is the channel. So now you should be able to see the NMOS. N plus source, then P channel, and then N drain. Of course, it is a very simplified diagram. The actual structure is much more complicated. There is no hiding the fact that there is indeed an NP and BJT as well. And that parasitic BJT can create problems. The solution is shorting the bulk and the source effectively shorting the base emitter of the NPN. So what is the advantage of this vertical structure? The biggest advantage is that this vertical structure uses the silicon real estate much more effectively. Unlike planar devices which are confined to the surface, this device uses the whole silicon. The other advantage is that the whole side of the die is drained, which reduces the R on. Okay, let's now address the other odd thing this N minus section in the middle. Because of its low doping, most of the space charge region of this PN junction is on N minus side. And that means most of the reverse blocking voltage appears across this N minus region. This section of the silicon is known as drift region. Drift region is doped based on the desired voltage rating of the MOS. And doping of P region dictates the threshold voltage. But however great this vertical structure might be, it's not really cut out for the standard CMOS processes. So now that we have understood the origins of letter D, let's return to LDMOS. LDMOS has source, body and gate as any other normal MOS. Adjacent to the body is lightly doped drift region. And finally we have an N plus region for the drain. In most cases, this whole structure is encapsulated within a isolated anvil pocket. So as you can see that an LDMOS can actually be much bigger than a standard CMOS. Depending on the technology, the details of the structure differ, but they all follow the same basic body plan. And of course, there are LDP MOSs, which are just a mirror image of this LDN MOS. So now that we have understood the basic structure of the LDMOS, Let's now look at the usage in the circuit. To save some area, LDMOSs almost always share the drain between the two sources on the either side. So they almost always have minimum two fingers. As I mentioned before, a very important consideration is that you can either have high voltage or high current, but not both simultaneously. Another way to say is that high VGS and high VDS are not allowed at the same time. That is, unless you have a very low duty event. To understand it better, consider a normal boost output stage. Let's say in the beginning prefet is on and it's supplying current to the output. Then we turn off the prefet, but the current continues to flow through the body diode of this prefet. So during this phase, the prefet is on and it is carrying the high current, but its VDS is small. There is high voltage across this NMOS, but it is off. That means VGS is zero. That means we are not violating this condition for any of the two MOSs. Now let's turn on the NMOS. It takes a finite amount of time, a few nanoseconds, for V switch to come to zero. So for this circuit to work, NMOS has to spend some time where both VGS and VDS are high. But notice that it is a low duty transient event. If switching frequency is 2 MHz, then 5 nanoseconds spent here is only 1% of the duty cycle. And this type of low duty events are acceptable for LDMOS. It is also acceptable if the current is really small. Typically, a few microampere for every micrometer of the device width are acceptable. Please consult your technology design rule manual for exact number. This is relevant in the cases where LDMOS is used as a protection device for the current mirrors. But what is the issue if we have a high VGS and high VDS together in LDMOS? Let's consider that NMOS of the boost again. Let's say VDS is 20 volt and NMOS is on and it's carrying an ampere of current. And that means this NMOS is dissipating 20 watts of power across it. Believe me, it is an enormous amount of power dissipated in a small area. I have seen silicon melting away at less than one tenth of this power. 
so be mindful of it high voltage doesn't mean high current matching is another point to be aware of ld mosfets are not designed to be used in precision circuits they can be and often are used for the protection circuits but not as a main mirror of current mirrors or as a gain stage and by this time you may have already observed that ld mosfets are asymmetrical devices so mind your sources and mind your drains ld mosfets are fascinating devices and if you intend to work in power circuits make sure you develop a good understanding of these mosfets i'll see you in next video so take care and thanks for watching